Welcome to the VO School podcast, dedicated to the art, craft, and business of voiceover. Each week builds upon the last to give you a comprehensive understanding of a career in VO. My name's Jamie Muffet. I'm a full-time voice talent and audio engineer, and I'll be joined by some of the industry's top professionals on both sides of the microphone to drill down and dig up the truth. Hello, hello. Welcome to the VO School podcast. This is the voiceover guide part two. And today we're talking about coaching, demo production, networking, and getting your first job. So we're really kicking things on here. Before we begin, I have an exciting announcement. The winner of Celia Siegel's brand audit competition is Marissa Blake. So congratulations to you, Marissa. She actually already knows. <laughs> We are going to be recording that brand audit and putting it out in the new year as an episode. So we'll all get to be a fly on the wall when she receives her brand audit. And I think it should be really interesting from a marketing and branding perspective. Very quickly, if you would like to connect with us on social media, you can connect with us on Facebook. The address is facebook.com slash groups slash VO School podcast and on Twitter at VO School Pro. And in future, I'm not going to give you all the millions of links because I've created a website and that is voschoolpodcast.com. So links to all of the social media and all the ways you can listen to the podcast are there and also the ability to get in touch with me via email and all of the ever-growing team around this podcast. So without further ado, let's get straight to it. Style. Power. You're watching the home of the NFL. The all-new iPhone. Reserve your Disney World season pass now. Through all the runny noses, three in the morning coughs. An all-new American crime story, tonight on FX. Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. In episode five of the podcast, I spoke to Anne Ganguza and Mary Lynn Wisner, who are two extremely well-respected coaches. And my first question to them was, what kind of VO coaching options are there available to new entrants? You know, if you're talking about coaching as in just one-on-one -on -one solo coaching, because mm. um, that's sort of how we define coaching. Um, that is important, but I think it's really important for somebody new to the business to actually get in a beginning workshop first right. because, or, or concurrently, because, um, you know, it's, it's supportive. You're with like-minded people that are in the same situation as you. They're, they're all starting. And it's, it's the practical things that you're going to learn in a very beginning workshop. You know, this is the mic, this is technique. You stand this close to a mic, you don't do this, you do, you know, and, and those sorts of things. Whereas, um, and you know, Anne might have something different to add to that, but the, but the coaching idea is obviously, more intense one-on-one -on -one training. Mm. And, um, I have found for me when I coach complete newbies, I always pretty much, you know, I can give them one coaching session, but I think it's really important, at least what I have found for them to just, okay, do that. Now go take a, a five week class, you know, the, the one of those and then come back. And then we'll hone in and find your niche and, and kind of perfect what you've learned right. because the, uh, the, the practical stuff is so important and, and they might find it's not something that's for them, you know, um, mm. but at least get their, you know, dip their toes in the water. Yeah. See, see if they like it. I agree wholeheartedly with having both types of experiences, both the one-on-one -on -one and the group setting. And especially when you're starting out, I think it's really helpful to have a group setting because you may be timid. You might be intimidated or, or you know, when you're up at the mic. And so you have a lot of people that can identify with you if they're in the same experience level. Yeah. And so you have a lot of, as Mary Lynn said, like-minded people. And so I think that's really helpful. And it's, I think that your learning experience is broadened by watching others up at the mic and oh, being yeah. directed. And 
one-on-one coaching, I think, is great for the customization of it. And I'm a big believer because I've been in education for 25 years. I'm a big believer in homework and that there must be something that the student does every day that is related to voiceover. Because a lot of these people that are coming that are new to the industry may have a full-time job, they have families, you know, or part-time job, however it is, they need to allocate time to make it a part of their their routine so that they understand what the, what the career and what the industry is about. And I think, I think a lot of times I would tell people that part-time voiceover is almost more difficult than full-time because Mm. you have less time. (laughs) And when you're starting out, you've got a market, there's a ton of things that you have to do. And so I think that the combination of the group workout and, and a one-on-one coaching that, you know, not, you know, that can meet up every week, every week, if you've got a goal, I think is good with homework, <laughs> doing something voiceover related every day. Anne and Mary Lynn are both coaches based in LA, and I asked them both if it was crucial to be in LA for coaching, or if you can reach out to them or other coaches via Skype or Zoom or telephone if you live in a more remote location. Yeah, I mean, you can, yeah. you can reach out to anybody. Technology. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah that's that's the beauty of it. Um, you know, Anne has these wonderful classes that um, half of the, the um, some of the students are there in person, and then she opens it up to people that are all over the world. So mm-hmm. it, it's kind of like you're right there in the class. It's, it's fabulous. Um, and so most, most of the big coaches um, are available to you on Skype or Zoom sessions um, or phone. Um, and then... Um, as far as workshops go, um, I know I, I do a lot of traveling. I travel all over the country, uh, you know, um, doing, uh, you know, workshops that, you know, I, I'll, twice a year, once a year, I'll go do a, a, a Saturday all day in New York and then maybe Portland or right. Seattle or something like that. So check those out. I think the best thing for an actor to do, a voice actor or want to be voice actor is try and see if there's any voiceover meetup groups in your right, city. Yeah. So that's one thing to just just start, you know, look up a meetup group and see if there's one in there or start one. And then um, I've had several meetup groups reach out to me and say, hey, we meet up every Tuesday morning. Can we hire you to coach us all for one mm-hmm. hour? Oh, that's you know, a great idea. Like that. yeah. and, and Anne does that, too, I think. Right. And, and yep. um, every and month. Then, yeah. So, it, so every month I have a workout with my, with my peeps group. That's one of the reasons why I formed the networking group, VO peeps, just as Marilyn was saying, it was to create that, that community and that in person and make that available as well as online. So every yeah. month I do a workout with a different, de- a different guest director. Oh, cool. It's kind of like that. This is the one career where there's kind of no excuse for you to say, I don't know how to get started. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Because yeah. it is, it is the one career where you can do everything online. I mean, it it's Unless not always not ideal. Yeah. yeah, it's not always ideal, but it's completely accessible. So then, I wanted to know what actually goes into voiceover coaching, and what makes a good voiceover coach. Uh, well, let's see. That's a good one. Let me just kind of like free associate here. I think it's somebody who listens. I think it's somebody who has their finger, like answered on the pulse of what's, what's happening, not only as a performer, but, you know, casting director like myself Mm -hmm. or a producer, um, who is aware of the trends, you know, what's booking now, what's being asked for, or even has some insight into what might be coming down the pike. Um, and, and is very well versed in the industry knows who the players are, who the, who the agents are, who the producers are, who the, you know, the, the rosters are, you know, knows the industry. And, and then on top of that, yes, you can know all that stuff and not be a good coach. I think being a good coach, I think it is a gift. I think it's, um, you know, and I, and I, I do feel lucky that I, that I do that. Um, Mm. I think that I, I, I think, kind of like the coaches that aren't good because there are a lot of them that maybe have done three or four voiceovers and suddenly they start coaching. (laughs) Um, there are quite a few of those out there. They eventually sort of just, you know, fall off by the wayside because some Mm. people can't coach. It's, it is, it's a, it is a talent. I think it's a different kind of skill set that not a lot of people have. Don't, yeah. Don't you think so, Anne? Yeah. And, and I think it works its way. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's if, if, if your coaching style is not working well with students, I think it just, 
it, people can tell that's number one. And I also think to be a good coach, you have to, to have the, you have to have the strength to be able to be honest with your students if they're not ready to, you know, let's say make a demo or if they maybe they've got, you know, a, a speech pattern that needs to be corrected and, and that it's something that you can't necessarily handle. <laughs> or let's yeah. say, like, I wouldn't coach somebody in animation because that's not my genre. That's not where my expertise is. And so I'm happy to refer, right. you know, um, people to other coaches if I'm not adept at that. So I think, and, and I think it's hard, it's really hard for coaches to to say no right. to some students, but there will be some, some, some students that I won't take on because I know that the skills are lacking, let's say technology skills, right? If there, it's an older client that, you know, I, I'm going to be like, well, you're going to have to be able to hire an assistant to help you with this, or you're going to have to go take a class, right. you know, especially new people to learn all this. And I, and, and I think that that is important that you're honest and upfront. And that takes a lot, I think, to be a good coach. It's, it's because yeah. you don't want to, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a person who doesn't like to hurt people's feelings, but honestly, I'm not going to waste your money. So very unfortunately in voiceover, there are a lot of predatory voiceover coaches who reach out trying to get students and they may not be well qualified, they may be over or undercharging and offering something that they can't deliver. So I asked Anne and Mary Lynn, what red flags are there to help you avoid such coaches? If you're going to get a demo produced over a weekend... Right. You know, yeah. after a weekend of workshops, that's number one. And any promises of quick riches, yeah. I think, is a red is a, an immediate red flag. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's no you. This the it's it's acting. There's absolutely there's no guarantee of anything. I've worked right. with some talent that are so brilliant, and they still can't get an agent. They still. Um, you know, because they can't get an agent, they're not getting certain opportunities. And, you know, so it, it's such a kind of precarious industry. It's, it's a lot of it is luck, yeah. but, um, yeah, the number one, you, you look for the red flags. Uh, you never want to take a workshop where they promise you a, a demo at the end of it, unless it is like a pro workshop right? Yeah, and you know, you're at that level and you're there to learn, you know, some extra stuff and, and something yeah. like that. But if you're a newbie, you never do that. Um, you never want to take a workshop where, um, they say, oh, we're going to have an agent here or casting directors and they're currently casting this show for Disney or this or that or whatever, because number one, that's illegal. They can't do right. that. Right. Yeah. Um, and they can't, so yeah, so they can't do it. So you know that, that it's a fake advertising advertising. Yeah. No promises of no yeah, promises of success or right. bookings or, you know, getting yeah. into an agency. None of that should, should there's, be a promise. Yeah. There there's absolutely, it's impossible. You cannot say if you take our course, uh, uh, for six, after six weeks, we guarantee you will be making six figures. It's impossible. Oh yeah. You the six figure thing. Yeah. I, see that all the time. I have I to know. say the six figure thing, no matter what, in any context really bothers me because it just does. I mean, most businesses, if you're not even talking voiceover, you know, rule of thumb is five years for a return on investment. Yeah. And lately in this economy, it's closer to 10. And I'm a, I, you know, I am proof of that in terms of, I mean, working and working so many, the longevity has a lot to say in this industry yeah. because the brands are not born overnight in, in voiceover, you know, like national commercials are not, they don't happen after a weekend of training for a new person. It just doesn't unless you're really well connected. And, yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's a whole different, that's a whole different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're oh, we'll not well that, connected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What you do, what you can do is ask around, you know, if, yeah. if you're thinking of taking a, a workshop or studying with a particular co quote unquote coach, um, you know, go on the Facebook forums. There's a lot of voiceover Facebook forms, mm. um, you know, and Anne has like VO peeps go on yep. there, check out, you know, people talk about ask. coaches or whatever and ask around. Um, basically any agent, you know, to get to an agent, you know, the first thing they're going to say is who did you coach with? Where'd you study? What have you, you know? Right. Um, and if you haven't done any of that, but you went ahead and made a demo, it's, it's a waste of your money. They're not going to, they're, they're going to say, Oh, this guy has no training. They're going to make you go do it anyway. 
Right. So, you know, you don't want to waste your money. You don't want to study with somebody that is not already influential in the business. I think that's pretty much the, the best rule of thumb to go by. This final question is one from the audience from Carl Marie Colucci, and she wanted to know, what are the biggest mistakes new talent make when working with a new coach? I don't know that I would call it a mistake necessarily, but one thing that's frustrating to me is kind of getting in your own way. If, if I'm telling you something, it's because I'm telling you because I know it's going to help you. Right. And so to, to, not, to not let yourself be helped, I think is big. And, and I know that sounds kind of simple, but it is a frustration I, I come across a lot where I, I think to myself, wow, you're paying me to help you and you don't want to take that advice. Right. So if what's going to happen is you're just not going to grow in the business. And you have to sometimes let those inhibitions down, let that fear go, and just go for it. Because, again, I've been in this so long, I do know what I'm talking about. I'm not just saying something to say it. I'm saying it to really help you. Yeah. So if, if you don't want to take that advice to me, then you're just wasting your money. So I think that might be one of the biggest things that is I find annoying. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Right. Well, I, I think I can, I'm going to say not to be um, not to be so in Hollywooded, should I, can I say that? Is that a word that yeah. there's, that, that <laughs> there's the mean. glamour of, there's the glamour of certain genres of voiceover that people are, insist that they must, I must do animation. And right. so maybe not, maybe not being able to look at the industry as a whole or to, to kind of see the many other aspects of it and maybe you know, not be open to that because there's lots of ways to help yourself. I think a lot of new talent have a misconception about how easy it is to get into the industry and they think, okay, I'm I, now that I've, I've done my coaching and, and I'm just going to get a demo and then I'm going to get work. And it's not like that. There's so many other aspects to it that's going to make you a successful talent and a successful business. And to have your eyes open to the other aspects too. And I'm constantly, and I know Marilyn too, constantly talking about like, it's not just the voice. You've got to be able to be business savvy yes. and be able to get out there and market. And if you can't, or you won't, or you don't want to, then you have to hire somebody to do that. Yeah. And, and you need to have, and you, you need to have a financial, I want to say a good financial um, a plan. plan because mm. freelance is completely different than corporate. I mean, yeah. corporate, Somebody's paying you a very steady paycheck and freelance, you know, making that transition is really tough, is really tough uh, unless you're prepared for it. And you have like a little bit of a financial cushion that when the times are sparse and when you first start out, you know, you may not get a job for a month or two or three or six or, you know, that. And so you have to be prepared for that. Episode six was a discussion with Terry Daniel and J. Michael Collins, who are both demo producers. And this episode was all about demos. And my first question was, what does your demo do for you as a voice talent? There's always myths out there. Well, you only need a professional demo if you're going to try to get on an agency roster, which I think is BS because I get producers asking me all the time for my demo. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's not it's not just for talent agents. This is representing yourself like a calling card, like J. Michael said. And, you know, it's interesting because demos are just getting shorter and shorter all the time. Now there's agencies that want like less than 60 seconds. I remember when I think I did my first one. This is going to date me in like 1989. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, where I think I, I had everything on a cassette, you know, three minutes long, you know, anything from a theme park announcement to an industrial narration to a commercial to an on hold message yeah. to a quote unquote book on tape, as we call it back then. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of the way it was. It's what it felt way back when. And now everything's just very, yeah, very niche based. Back then it was know? all account. Terry, I think you and I are probably both from the the same school that our first demo reels actually were reels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I worked with reel and reel to reel and radio, but my first uh, demo was obviously one where I didn't know any better. So of course I I tried to do it myself and fell flat on my face. As uh, you know, as we always try to tell people that if you're yeah. really passionate about doing this, just don't. I mean, wh why? What you're wasting your time? You're wasting everybody's time yeah. by right. trying to do something yourself. But. It was fun. Uh, I do kind of miss sending the cassettes out in a beautiful little package along with a dozen roses, a box of chocolate, <laughs> you know, and really dressing it up to impress the agent. You could put all this this stuff in the, the, the envelope to make it kind of stick out. I do kind of miss, and I do mean uh, kind of, 
uh, <laughs> the whole present the the whole snail mail presentation that we always seemed to come up with back then. Well, there are a, a few agencies I've I've noticed around the country that still take uh, physical submissions. So there are hand, uh, yeah, there are a handful. But you know, one one of the other things, and Terry knows this that you guys know that my position and um, you know interest in online casting sites has evolved over the years. But there are mm-hmm. still some out there that like Badalgo and Voice One Two Three, for that matter, where you can go and not have a middleman taking money, and you can get a reasonable experience. And yeah. uh, you know, your demo on those sites, something a lot of people don't know about the online casting sites is that about half of the work that's being hired through these sites is being hired through search. And what are they searching? They're searching demo categories more than anything else. So, you know, you're going up against some very premium talent on these sites and you need to have a demo that's competitive because when you're found in search, you you get that same 8, 10, 15 seconds that an agent gives you. And then, you know, again, if you draw them in, they'll listen to the whole thing. Um, But you've got to get their attention so they need to know it's pro right off the bat if you want to get those private invites, which are often the very best jobs you'll find on the online sites. I then wanted to find out what the whole demo production process looked like. So my first question was, how do you start producing a voiceover demo? In my opinion, it's a long process. It's not medical school, but it's it's all about the coaching. Mm. Coaching, coaching, coaching for as long as it takes. Uh, I don't want to bash any competition around the country. Um, but I do know that there's companies around the company where everybody has the same amount of coaching sessions. Everyone's reading from the same scripts. Right. And there, there's no individuality at all. There's no branding whatsoever. Everybody is more, you know, taken in as a number. And it's not right. Mm. Uh, I like to work. That, that, that doesn't happen in our business, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I like to work. And I think, Jay, my, we probably, you know, we do things, I think, the, the same way. And we like to work with people until they're ready for the demo. And sometimes that can take up to a year. You know, it's yeah. not going to be 12 years like medical school or something like that. I hope not anyway. But <laughs> uh, it's not like, you know, you go to a Saturday uh you know, conference and suddenly Monday morning, you're ready to do a demo. I mean, that's just mm. complete absurdity. So I like to, to work with people until they're, they're damn ready to do the demo. And sometimes, you know, there'll be a specialty that'll come out that you're not even aware that you're even good at. You know, there's a lot of what's, what's the beauty of this process is there uh, a lot of times there's even a surprise. You know, I had no idea that my niche would be e-learning and theme park announcements. Whoever saw that coming, I wanted to do what everybody else did 20 years ago. I want to do a cartoon voice. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I wanted to be Captain Character Cartoon, you know, who doesn't? Or movie trailer guy. I mean, we all kind of have those kinds of ambitions when we uh, first get started. But, uh, you know, I never knew that I'd be doing like technical narration and doing theme park announcements for amusement parks and and everything like that. So, yeah. Right. Getting back to your to your question, it's just, you know, working with that, being more of a mentor. I don't mind the word coach, but I, you know, to me, especially in this era of voiceover, I like using the word mentor a little bit better because yeah. uh, it, 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 it takes the pressure off of having to, like, get through, like, a coaching program by a certain date or some ridiculous deadline that's going to put tension on both parties. Right. Work with the person until they're damn ready to do the demo. Some people will take four to six months some people take a year you know you just have to be ready to work as hard as you can for as long as you can yeah and i and i think the you know the demo is the end of a process not the beginning of the process and i I think there are too many people who you know if you you, again terry and i aren't here to bash any competition but i'll tell you one big red flag if somebody says hey you know come to a seminar for a weekend and uh, we'll do your demo at the end of it and you'll have that and be ready to go that's that's a big warning sign okay because you're if you're especially if you're new to the business um you know you're you're not ready you're not ready to make something that's going to be competitive you don't understand the nuance and the subtlety that separates somebody who's dead on arrival in an audition from somebody who is shortlistable from the person who actually books the job and yeah. those are very distinct levels so uh you know i'm i tend to prefer working with people who are probably a little bit closer to being demo ready if i have a new talent who comes in who's just you know is for me going to be a year process that's something that i will usually farm out to somebody else um mm-hmm. simply because my business model doesn't allow me 
to emphasize coaching uh, as, as much. But right. um, you know, if 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 somebody's bringing you in and saying, you know, you're brand new to the business, so let's do two sessions and get you a demo, that's <laughs> really something to be alarmed about. Oh, yes, yeah. and yeah. unfortunately, there is a lot of that out there, and you just have to. It's like any other business, you know. You really just have to do your research carefully. You know, there's books out there that are going to make this sound really easy. Like you're going to like, you know, you're going to fall asleep and wake up in the morning and somebody's going to knock on your door with a big bucket of money. That didn't happen <laughs> you know, to hey, you? Hey, man, I heard your voice is great, man. Everybody's talking about your voice. <laughs> you know, it's just, I mean, it's like, come on. I mean, it's like, I think, I mean, obviously, I think everybody and their second cousin has written a voiceover book these days. But, <laughs> yes. I mean, you really well, have you, to go through it, the process. Word, word of new. mouth. Word of mouth is, is, I mean, this business, I think, more than any I've ever encountered, is a word of mouth business. And yeah. if you're going to pick a coach, if you're going to pick a demo producer or a mentor, as Terry said, um, it's not hard if you do your research and you talk to a, a wide selection of different people within the industry to figure out who has your best interests in mind and who doesn't. Yes. Um, because the ones who don't, that gets out there on the street very quickly. And the ones who are doing shoddy work, that gets out there on the street very quickly. So talk to people. Those of us who you know care about what we do and care about you as a voice actor and care about the fact that we expect you will see return on your investment when you work with us... Um, um, you talk to a hundred people. I, I, I've never heard anybody say a bad thing about Terry. Um, you know, and I and I hope the same is true about me. Yeah, I've only heard really bad things about Jamie. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, that know, makes sense. That, that makes you got to watch the Brits, though. <laughs> <laughs> So getting a demo produced is an expensive proposition. So a lot of people will do it themselves. I wanted to find out what the dangers were in having a bad demo. Well, it happened to me when I f did my first one myself. I mean, I had to beg uh, my local talent agent to at least take me in for a meeting after I wasted her time sending her this piece of shit. Wow. <laughs> you know, and it was just like, they they really, agents have an incredible memory for the bad right. stuff. I mean, ask Eric Shepard. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, it's <laughs> like, if you really, really, I mean... It's if you think about anything else that you would do, I mean, uh, I'll go back to the reference of, of being an on camera talent or even a model. I mean, you're not going to take a selfie with your smartphone and send that to an agency. I'm sure people probably try to do it. But, you know, the agents have such an incredible memory for this horrible stuff. It's like sometimes you won't even get it, you know, a second chance. It's such a cliche in our business, but I have to use it anyway. This really is an industry where you get a lot of times one chance to make a good impression. And right. uh, especially, you know, it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning. If you want to be a step above what the agents are already getting, you know, sent in, you know, via MP3 or whatever, uh, it's got to be a kick ass demo. Mm. Well, if you're playing, I mean, that, that's such an important point because if you are going, you know, if you're, if you're playing the union game, if you're going for the big California agents, the big LA and New York agents, um, everybody's good. Yeah. And everybody has a demo from one of the dozen or so top demo producers out there. I'm not going to throw names out there because I will inevitably leave somebody out and mm -hmm. piss somebody off. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but everybody's got a, a quality demo. So now what is on yours, the scripting? How has that demo producer actually dialed in on who you are and brought out your best voice actor? Um, what makes you just a little bit better than, than everybody else? And, uh, you know, at that level, that, that's what the demo is doing for you. In terms of having a bad demo, what's the danger? Um, you know, like Terry said, first impressions are important. I cast. I hire three or four times a week for my own clients. And, mm. you know, I get people sending me demos all the time. Um, in my opinion, a mediocre demo isn't necessarily going to get you blackballed or be memorable for the person who's in the position of hiring, whether that's an agent or a casting director or just somebody like me uh, who does it for his own clients. Um mm. But a really bad demo definitely will, because if you, yeah. if you make a, if you make an immediate negative impression or one that I want to actually pass around to my friends because it's so awful uh, and and have a laugh, and I'm really not that mean spirited, but we we you know we've been known to do things like that once or twice, uh, you know then, then then you're in big trouble because then all then your name's on on our radar or you know, on a buyer's radar, an agent's radar, and if you submit again six months from now or a year from now, maybe five years down the road they won't remember you, but in the short term, yeah, you're, you're going to be in trouble. 
So next, we looked at what characteristics make a good demo. Well, I, I, for me, the first thing is that right now is scripting. Um, yeah. I'm. Right. I, I think what's happening right now is you've got about a dozen of us out there who, if you go to me or Terry and any of those other people who I'm not going to name to avoid irritating them, um, <laughs> you you can be 100% positive that you're going to get top quality production and you're going to get an experience that is tuned into who you are and that's bespoke and that's personalized. That's important. So there are a lot of people, again, do your research, but there are a lot of us who can give you quality work. I think the arms race right now a little bit is in scripting. What can we do Mm. to make you rise above and stand out compared to the other people who are submitting demos to these agents and potential buyers? And for me, the line that I always like to use is that when I'm, and I do all the scripting myself, with the talents collaboration, I handwrite every script that goes into a demo. And one of the things I try to do, assuming that it is appropriate, but most of the time I find a way to make it appropriate, is to have at least one or two spots on whatever that demo is that are going to make the agent blow coffee out of their nose. <laughs> be, be, yeah. and and I, you I, know, I've I, seen that happen, and it's quite impressive. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a neat thing. But what I what I want, I mean, we did one with with the talent who, you know, the, the first line on our demo commercial demo was did you just fart uh, and it was it, it was a, a, a Maylox commercial you know the they were beating the parents the boyfriend was there they were outside of the door and uh, you know it's it's I want I want the agent to take that thing into the the reception and play it and yeah. just be like, can you what? Huh? Can you, <laughs> you want you want you want you, you want to get their intention and be memorable in a good way? And I think right now that's that's the big fight going on is can you have that little extra edge and mm. and be interesting enough um, to hold their attention? Because anybody can do a Mercedes commercial, right? You right. know, yeah, the content. I agree, and I was happy to hear uh, J. Michael say that because we write all original scripts for our demos as well. And we don't go to a certain website out there and grab it from a, you know, a, a, a script page or anything like that, like a lot of people do. I like to we like to write scripts not only based on, on kind of what they're what they've learned and what their possible niche will be, but also based on, you know, some of their hobbies and interests as well. It really a demo really has to be more about them and less of the producer, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, it's and they've got it. You know, the clips on there have to sound, you know, like something they would actually be into because I, I've noticed that I get more passion out of the performance when they read scripts of content that they're actually really into. You know, if it's a computer geek thing or maybe they're into sports or, you know, electronic devices or whatever it will be. I mean, it's unbelievable. No matter how much coaching they've had, they tend to it's there. There's an excitement level there and the focus is there if they have content that's not only original, but content that they're actually really into. It's amazing. Now, the most blunt question of the day goes to this one. <laughs> um, how much should you expect to pay for a demo? I would say $17,000. Yeah. <laughs> dollars. <laughs> <A> million dollars. Give us your money. <laughs> look, it, look I, you know, we, we all want to preserve rates uh, just like we do with, with voiceover jobs among demo producers. Yeah. But um, I, I would say if anybody's charging you less than $1,000, you should you should kind of ask why um yeah. because and then run yeah and then run uh and yeah. and that's lower than what i charge but if you know i would say that is just kind of a baseline number if it's anything under that you really should have a, a serious question as to what quality you're going to get because I, I know terry's the same way i mean it takes time to do these things and yeah. we're i mean terry and i both our primary career is as voice actors we're behind the mic most of the time you know the coaching mm-hmm. and the demo production stuff it's secondary um, th- mm-hmm. This is in additional time that we have. And so, you know, if we're going to devote that much of our time where we could be out booking voiceover work, which is very lucrative, to producing your demo, there's going to be a price tag associated with it. And, uh, you know, and if you go to people who aren't voice talent, if you go to Chuck, if you go to Nancy, if you go to, you know, um, other well known demo producers, it's the same thing. They are taking time away from other potential lucrative opportunities to work on your demo. There's a reason we charge what we do. It's because we're going to give you everything that we have and make it as good as it can possibly be. And because our time is valuable at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and it's not something we just whip together. You know, we got 10 extra minutes of our time. I mean, we'll, as I mentioned before, 
it's it's a meticulous process. You know, I'm changing music around, sound effects around. I'm using different clips from one spot. I mean, it's it, it just you know, it it can be. I mean, in an exciting way, it's overwhelming. But this is something that can, that takes hours and hours of work. We don't just throw something into audition yeah. or pro yeah. tools and have it done for you in 10 well, and, minutes, and, and, and the, you script, know? the script writing on top of that is, is yeah. an exercise oh, and yeah. you know and real creativity that it, it's not a 10 minute process episode seven was entirely devoted to networking and this episode i had three guests on which seems appropriate we had tim friedlander brad venable and jay preston and i wanted to know first off what exactly is networking as it relates to the voice actor there's a lot of different things it can do, but I think one of the main things it does is get you out of your booth and get you out of that solo world that you kind of spend hours in. And then you can, because as far as I'm concerned, actors have like a, a bag full of tricks they can pull from. And if you don't get out there and interact with new people and and make new friends, you kind of your your bag of tricks kind of dwindles down. You got to refill it. So mm-hmm. for me, that's one of the main purposes of networking is just to refill that bag of tricks. And then along the way, you might make a connection that could make you some money or or just a great friend. Or so that's my take on it. That's great. Yeah, and it definitely gets you. There's no, you know, there's nothing like actually being in front of somebody in person. As many times as you may talk with somebody, you know, over the over Skype or over. Badalgo or whatever it is that you're you're working on. There's nothing like meeting somebody in person and getting mm-hmm. them getting a chance to see somebody in the flesh and actually shake their hand and have a conversation with them um, that sticks. You know, you stick in their mind and they stick in your mind, and that's the type of stuff that you really you I think is really important is to make those connections and keep those connections. And you know, I've met some of some of my the, my best friends that I've met in the last few years have been through voiceover networking. Jay, right. Jay and I met at a, at a workout group one night uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, yeah, and that's how I met Brad too. Uh, exactly. Networking in Las Vegas. Yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. It's part of the, the world voices convention. The second one of those, we, uh-huh. uh, we were hanging out there for a while and it was like, of course I had to see Jay's hat because <laughs> Jay has hats <laughs> like, he is like the Mad Hatter without the Mad part, <laughs> and <laughs> so it was really great. We just sat down and chatted for a little bit. It was like, "Hey, it's really great to meet you in 3D and share a little bit of air." Yeah, yeah. Even though the air there was a little stagnant at times, but it wasn't any one of our faults. So. <laughs> it's still better than LA. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> this is true. Yeah. <laughs> so, Brad, what does uh, networking mean to you as a voice actor? Uh, as a voice actor, I wouldn't have a career if it wasn't for networking. Mm. Honestly, I mean. Talent is talent. Uh, one of my my dearest friend coaches that I've ever taken is you know, Maurice Tobias. Mm. She said at at a certain level that the talent is assumed that if you walk into a room, you belong there. All that stuff. It's how you got to that room to begin with. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. And she's like, those things are assumed. You have to bring something unique to the table no matter what. And I, I just, you know, I'm. You know, some people will get, get all over me for the aw shuck stuff that it happens with me because, I, you know, I'm just a I literally am a farm boy who grew up in the middle of the sticks in Oklahoma and uh, decided this was something I wanted to do. And, you know, honestly, if it weren't for networking, I would have never gotten a voiceover, period, right. because I used to do crazy cartoon bad impersonations of of characters and people at, at frat parties to get free beer. Seriously, that's <laughs> kind of how I got into the VO. <laughs> yeah, that's a good origin story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have my career in voiceover if it wasn't for if it weren't for networking. Literally, would not have a career. I was eight hours away, less than eight hours away from quitting voiceover after having been doing voiceover for about twelve or thirteen years and failing at it for that entire time. And I had tickets to go to Voice 2014, and I was lying in bed thinking about going, and I almost rolled over and went back to sleep. And instead, I got on my motorcycle, drove to Anaheim, and ended up hanging out in the hotel for two days. And the core of the people that I know in the L.A. community from voiceover, I met at that convention. And I met people that I didn't even know existed at that convention and inspired me to to get back into voiceover and actually try it as a legitimate career as opposed to, as opposed to a hobby. And I right. wouldn't, I wouldn't be here without that. 
In this episode, we divided networking up into a few categories, and this first one was online networking. So I wanted to know, where do you start with online networking? I mean, that, that is, that's the million dollar question yeah, right there. Is. I mean, that, you know, that was part of, part of my frustration back, in, you know, when I was, when I, before I started meeting anybody is that you pick up the voiceover resource guide or you go and Google voiceover and you've got a million opportunities or a million resources who they all look the same. How, wh- where do you start? Who mm-hmm. do you, you know, who do you actually talk mm-hmm. to? Um, and, you know, in that sense, I think, at least for for me, Facebook has been a huge part of that. And as much as it sucks up my time, <laughs> it's also an amazing yeah. resource for that in 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 a way that can be that can be um, you, you can culti- cultivate friendships in a way on there that you can't with people you don't you know you don't normally see in person. I, I there's tons of people that I know on Facebook that I'll run into a convention and we're like, oh yeah, you're so-and-so. I'm like, oh yeah, you're Tim Friedlander. And they say, oh yeah, so how, you know, oh yeah, I saw you were on this trip last week and, and you've already got something yeah. in common to yeah. talk about, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it's, that's, I'm right there with you. I I know that there was, back in the early days of one of the pay-to-plays, they had a sponsored uh, web forum. Like there, mm-hmm. are two, there were at one point two major web forums for voiceover. One was the voiceover savvy forums put on my voice one, two, three at the time, and then the VOBB. And both of those places were, to me, prior to Facebook becoming kind of the end-all, be-all hub for online networking, such as it is. Those were the places that I got to know those folks. And then whenever everything started kind of nudging and migrating a little bit to Facebook, and everyone started coming out of the woodwork and really like, oh, I do voiceover too. Well, that's great. You know, now we all have like a really centralized tons of users, millions of users per day right. place. Mm-hmm. And that's that's pretty, pretty much it. It's like, you know, once you start friending everybody in the world in the industry, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the best way to do it. I mean, I did for, you know, when when there wasn't, you know, 50,000 people that that do voiceover on Facebook that are in groups and stuff. I mean, a couple of hundred people at that time, you know, about, you know, about 10 years yeah. ago or so for me. And then it just kind of exploded. And that's those groups, I think, the groups within like voiceover pros and some of the other some of the other prominent places and uh, the World Voices Organizations group and all that. Those were places that I'm going to get a chance to meet, quote unquote, air quotes, meet people and that's that's gives you at least some semblance of a foundation when you finally meet them in 3D at a conference or at a get together of some kind. Then all of a sudden, but the online thing was like the foundational thing. Yeah, it works in opposite right. ways. To it's yeah, like it yin yeah. and yang both ways. It's really cool. Yeah, and my way was kind of a little opposite because I don't when I don't when I don't, don't know anybody and I don't know who's giving me advice. I don't know if that's good advice or not. So I kind of steered i was in those little the uh the the, some of the voice groups on facebook in the beginning but i didn't know whose advice was good or who was even giving me advice or you know um and then i started just taking classes all throughout la and i decided to do a class in almost every place that i possibly could and every class i met some people that were really talented and i was like they are going to make it i want to be their friend (laughs) and but i'm really bad at names and I hate business cards. So the only way that I knew how to keep in contact with anybody was to create the create my own Facebook group of only people I've met and admire. Right. And that started with 5, 10, 15 and then a year went by and there was 50 of us and then all of a sudden it became like a voiceover networking group mm-hmm. that it just it grew and grew and now there's almost 500 members but it's all people I know or people that in the group who close friends like if Brad tells me, you know, there here are some people who are perfect for the group. You know, I'll bring them into the group, then I'll meet them at the next get together. <laughs> I did that two days ago. Do it that way. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, can't wait to yeah. meet. Yeah, they're great people too. Mm-hmm. But that's my take on it: was to only network with the people that I knew and that right. I trusted, and that were my kind of people. Um, and that's kind of how the VO Collective began, and and how everything keeps evolving from there. So with social media, online groups and various, various platforms that you can interact with people, your peers, casting directors, etc. I asked the team, where should you focus your efforts? Man, that is, you know, it's 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 kind of that's a tough question. It's 
it, it to me, I feel like the online and the offline world kind of go hand in hand and that that you need to find out who is in your area locally and mm-hmm. allow that to kind of branch out as well. You know, the online stuff is is great, but it's also, you know, it's very easy. And I think I think we've all seen this to have new people pop up in a group and all of a sudden start asking, you know, a million questions, which questions aren't bad by any means, Mm -hmm. but a million Mm -hmm. questions that have already been answered in this group. And they can do a, you know, if you do a search, a lot of times people say, Hey, just, you know, go search this, this for this forum for the question. And they'll pop up and they'll, they'll be really active for a couple or three weeks and then they disappear. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think it's being aware twofold that it's, that, that, that this isn't it's a long term thing you you're not going to get in I'm not, not going to say never but the chances of you getting in and being hugely, hugely successful within the first 6 months or a year are very slim and yeah, you got to look yeah. at the long term you got to look at i i always say it's playing the long game is that i'm mm-hmm. looking down the road 3 4 5 years from where i am now and hope and looking that far ahead to try and establish what i want to do as opposed to saying, okay well you know if i don't make something in the next 6 months then i'm just going to give this up Mm-hmm. You're not going to make it in, and again, I'd say, you know, never say never, but the right. chances of you making it in six months to a point where you can support yourself and have an established career in voiceover is very slim. Right. Oh, I agree. hundred percent. I'm not sure that answered the question, but I guess <laughs> the place to start is, you know, find, find other people who are doing what you do and see what they're involved in and right. branch out from there. And you'll meet somebody in a different group that says, Hey, you know, you should come check out this group over here. You go to that group and you may find a group that you really connect with and people that you really find mm-hmm. that you really have something in common with. And, you know, just because it's a Facebook group that says, you know, has whatever in its name doesn't mean it's the right group for you. Same thing with coaches or with anybody that you work with, because somebody says it's great doesn't mean it's the right one for you. Next, we moved offline and into the real world. And I wanted to know what kind of in-person networking events exist in voiceover. There's a lot of them. <laughs> There's a lot of and them. This is long from, and distinguished. Yeah. <laughs> from just yep. simply going to a workshop or uh, a class, that's one form of it. And then they have all these uh, seminars now and all these uh, conventions. And mm-hmm. who I tell you, there's so many ways to get out there. And some of them come to your town or some of them will. Um, you can even ask the college you went to to create one and that'll happen that way. Mm-hmm. And then all these groups have their own get togethers. We do one every month. There's another one that does one every two months. Mm-hmm. So there's just endless opportunities. And you can create your own. A lot of yes. people are so, they so want to get in a group to go do a thing. And I'm like, just create your own. And then once you're yeah. the leader of that group and it grows, you can, we can join up and we can all meet, you know, at that point down the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, there's no, there's nobody saying you can't start your own group. Unless you, you know you're the only person in your town doing what you do, <laughs> um, but you know, th- but then that's where the virtual stuff comes into play. I mean, there's no right. reason that you have to be isolated in this industry, regardless of where you are. You may not get the face the FaceTime that you get if you're in in a larger town where there's a bigger community, but there's no reason why you can't create your own community, which yeah. is what you know Jay and I did here in L.A. Purely out of the fact that I did it because I just didn't know anybody else. I was just I did it out of stupidity, I guess. <laughs> You know, <laughs> ignorance of what else was out there. I didn't know the industry. And instead of trying to figure out how to how to get into it, I just brought a bunch of people together that none of us knew the industry. And how does how does networking with your peers benefit your career other than camaraderie? Mm. You, the tricky thing is to not expect it to or want it to help your career. Yeah. Right. Like just hang, yeah. hanging out and talking about what you've been up to. Never... Never think, uh, I hope he asks me to be, a, hope he pitches me to whoever he's, like, if you think that way, then they're mm-hmm. not really your friends or peers, and you're just trying to use yeah. people. But yeah. it can uh, happen. The more that you're, you know, whoever's on the top of my mind, let's say there's 500 people mm-hmm. in this group I have, whoever's the most active, just by being nice and just by being active in themselves, they're always on the top of my mind. And when a casting opportunity comes around where I can suggest somebody to something or if a client needs something right away, I think of the people on the top of my mind, not the ones right. I brought in three months ago who aren't active. Like I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I forget that they're even around because they're not mm-hmm. continually active and I don't see them at the get togethers. So just the, you know, being around the people that you want to work with, you just get to work with them more. Yeah, right. exactly. I mean, we, we work in isolation booths. 
So if we, want, if we don't want to be isolated, we should leave those booths. Yeah. You know? And so really, whenever I moved here just, you know, a little over a year ago, it was like, holy crap, I have all the the opportunities a person could ever want to network in this industry. I mean, it is going to be the place I'm going to work and, and live. So, of course, I'm going to do that. And and I think that was one of the hallmarks of, I think, of my success being here has, I, you know, I, I kind of brag about it a little bit. It's like I've gone to a class or an event or a networking get together or something every single week since I've been here. Mm-hmm. Now, right. is that overkill? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. But, you know, it's just like Jay was saying, I put up a, a casting call for, uh, you know, a client that I've been working with off and on for three or four years, and they've got a big project and they want multiple voices for this and all this other stuff. And I was like, collective first thought. Mm-hmm. I, I reached out to about half a dozen people right off the top of my head that I thought could do, had the variety to do, you know, the versatility rather to do multiple characters. And <clears throat> then I, I reached out to the group in mass and, and that's how it ended up working. I mean, I, I guarantee you I, I was a little more scrutinizing to the people that I didn't know very well or hadn't even met because some of them, these are all people that know Jay, not necessarily that know me. Right. <laughs> so that it's definitely to, to way, you know, to, to dovetail on what he said was it, it's, there are some people that are your top of mind and right. they're not trying to, it's again, it's that reeking of desperation kind of thing that you were yeah. talking about, Tim was. You know, you can smell it through the phone. It's, it's, you know, mm-hmm. it's, that's the, you know, to good. I'm, I'm not trying to, to bad mouth cold calling again, but that was, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's whenever you don't approach it the right way, it's the same thing in all networking. If you're approaching right. it for yeah. this is going to get me work as opposed to, sure, I'm going to go to so and so's birthday party because I haven't seen them in three months. Right. Right. You know, and the time is flying when you're head down and you're working and stuff, which yeah. is wonderful. But then it's also like, oh, man, it's a drag. It's like tonight I'm going to, you know, come in and do the guest workout today with uh, with J.J. Jurgens here at, at Tim's place. And it's wonderful because I'm going to see people I haven't seen in three or four months. Yeah. And the last time I saw J.J., she and I are at the same agency. The last time I saw her was with a partner read. So it's right. like I'd love to get a chance to read for because, you know, in her other life she does this thing. And so anyway, I'm rattling. Yeah. But that, the, the <laughs> idea is, is that there is... In your in your place, if you don't have a if you don't have a group like the guys have been saying, do it. You know, yeah. just get outside of your booth and quit being isolated. So a lot of people face social anxiety, particularly in a group of people that they don't know. So I wanted to address the fear of walking into a room with the objective of networking for your career. I, I just talked to somebody. I, I had this conversation with somebody a couple of days ago and about networking and she's like god i hate like you know going in some place and having to like suck up to people and i'm like no yeah. no that's not at all what you're doing mm-hmm. you're going someplace to make friends yep and if you go yeah. someplace and see people who are doing what you're doing and make friends with them then then all of a sudden you're friends with somebody and you have something in common and then oh yeah by the way i happen to do voiceover also because we're at a voiceover thing right. and all of a sudden you have you have a way to connect with them that is not superficial on mm-hmm. and that is that is something that that is going to have deeper connections right and and also keep in mind when you do these networking things, if you're, <laughs> it's most of them are actors networking, so that's right. where it gets right. kind of annoying when you when you, if you go in at it thinking you're going to meet a casting director or an agent, you you probably won't meet them. Mm-hmm. It's right. all just actors networking, and and so don't go thinking that you know who's I got to meet the right person. I got to meet the who, the right person's in here somewhere, and I, and then if you're one of those people from the middle of the country who are just overly nice. You're going to be stuck talking to one person for the whole networking event. Sorry. No, no, it's totally. It's just I've, I've, I've come to learn that the middle of the country is just so nice, and they just talk, and they just, you know, the East Coast, East Coasters. Won't stop. I, I come into networking events, and I'm like, blah, 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 talk. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to go talk to these guys now, and I'll just cut you right off, and I'll go talk to somebody else. You know, because I only have off. two hours to try to meet as many people as I can. You exactly. know, and and it just just be yourself and be friendly. You don't have to try. Yeah. And that's no. and as soon as you start trying, yeah. you start hating it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because we were talking about you know like my my thing is I'm a big nerd about everything and and we all tend to geek out about things that we're passionate about. Well, one thing about VO that you can hold you know you can hang your hat on here is that we're all geeks about VO. I mean, right. if we <laughs> if we 
if we're not talking shop about something, it's going to be it's going to be talking about you know, gear or it's going to be talking about, you know, whose class are you taking or all this other right. stuff. And everyone just shares. It's right. not like it's not like that that typical, I guess, stereotypical. Let's see what we see in movies and on TV about how everyone in the world and acting hates each other, which is not true at all, especially in voiceover. Especially, no, no, yeah. 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 Especially in voiceover. in voiceover. Jeez, everyone is nice. I mean, there's like maybe two or three people that I wouldn't want to talk to. Yeah. And that's about it. And it's genuinely nice. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's genuinely nice. It's Exactly. It's, you know, years later where you're waiting for, for it to change and it hasn't changed. No. And the yeah. people are like, you know, coming into this and they, they come and hang out for a couple classes or they go to a couple meetups. And they're like, okay, well, everybody's really nice. When, when do they when do they all start becoming jerks? I'm like, no, it doesn't. It's I and I don't. I'm, I think we talk about this a lot. It's like I have no idea why we're all so nice. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I don't either, really. I guess but, it's just that it's true that everyone is really just. We all love it so much. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that's yeah. if that pay it forward thing is as cliche as that sounds. That that's what it is. But well, you know, the rising tide lifting all boats. I mean, honestly, why why voiceover as opposed to. Any other creative endeavor, God knows the art world isn't like that, right? <laughs> yeah, no. And it's just there's just so much work that you can do, you know. I had to include this last bit of audio because Brad really, really brings it home on this point, and so does Jay. So here we talk about having a plan and executing that plan. Yeah, it's funny, like uh, not to get really f- philosophical here, but you know, Napoleon Hill, you know. We wrote all the, you know, think and be rich and all the, you know, the how to succeed in in life without really trying, but really trying yeah. kind of thing. He, he always said that, you know, have set a date on the stuff that you want to do. Like, you know, like Tim was saying, five years down the road in five years, I want to be here. Well, that's that's a dream with a deadline that makes it a goal. That's what he always said. A goal is a dream with a deadline. And that's something I've been, you know, I've held on to it for a long, long time. And having that. You know, seeing the big picture and, and, you know, working backwards, in fact, that's another thing that that I've I've learned is a really great thing. So you want to be in an animated series that has toys for Nickelodeon or for Dream or whatever. Just pick a company yeah. and it's like, OK, how do you get on that show? OK, this person submits to these people. And so you need to you need to be able to have an audition that doesn't suck that gets in front of this person that's going to submit it to these people. Okay. Well, how do you get to that person and work backwards, 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 incrementally to the point where, okay, I literally know every single step that I need to take in order to be ready when that opportunity comes. Yes. Right. All of a sudden, bam, you're there and be prepared to be ready when that opportunity shows up get people. People have to know you to want to work with you. And if they don't know you, they're not going to hire you network, make groups in your own town. Mm Mm-hmm. Go to the you know the online workouts at our voweeklyworkout.com and sign up for that. Get heard by people so that you're not just sitting in your booth by yourself all the time. Yeah, because chances are people in this world they're going to get to know your name before they know your face or even know anything about you. And let your performances in those workout opportunities and and all let those things come out. Right, you know, yeah. don't fake it. <laughs> That's great, Jay. Any last words? No, these guys covered everything. Wine, <laughs> good wine, wine. 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 Also, <laughs> yes. have fun in life. Yes, and I, you yes. know, networking as as far as all that networking, and auditioning, doing your job, that's great. But also, don't forget to go on an adventure and have fun and live life and go do fun things that have no job relation, so that you can then, when you get to a networking event, have something to talk about that you've been doing that isn't work. Right, I, I swear, experience, I, huh? I make no, I, I make way more better impressions when I can talk about where I've been recently than when I've been talking about what video game I've been playing. You know, that was a different part of my life. I just still play them, but I I adventure way more now and it's way more fun to have that to talk about rather than work and this and that. And then they get to really see the real you and that conversational yep. thing everyone's looking for. They'll be yep. like, he's a really good conversationalist. The final episode that we're covering today is episode eight. And it's all about finding your first voiceover job. And joining me for this episode was Rachel Naylor and Armin Hirschstetter. My first question was, should you join any of the online marketplaces for finding work? Online casting is something that has established itself over the last, at least uh, the last decade. Mm. We see more and more people using those services because they are very easy to use. It makes life much easier for, for 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 the clients. 
uh, to some degree for the talents as well as I believe, because uh, they get the jobs delivered to their doorstep. So, but there are pay to place and there are pay to place. Bodalgo, and I will only talk about Bodalgo. Yeah. Although I would like to talk about some of the others, but no, no, I, I promised. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it's. I'm uh, not going to slander anyone down that road. <laughs> yeah. so, not go there. Um, <laughs> now, the 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 important thing to understand is, unlike other websites, Bodalgo will not let anybody in, no matter what they write on their fancy landing pages. It's it's, it's all BS to me because mm. I see the talents that are there, and when and and when I click a demo, and the demo starts like. Hello, <laughs> this is. Uh, I, I'm about to throw, uh, chop my breakfast on the mirror. It's, um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's insane how how they they treat their clients, and it's insane how they treat the talents. They 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 exploit the vanity of people that cannot judge whether they're good or not. Right. And this is not what, what. Well, I don't want to be to be in 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 that game. So Budalga only uh, lets. Um, people in that have a professionally trained voice. Okay, there could be some where I say, okay, you're not right there, but your voice is pretty unique. I don't have that many talents like of your area and you you, you have a unique touch. Okay, let's let's let him or her in. But um, if, if your demo um, is technically not up to scratch, there's no chance. And if you just, and you can hear within two seconds if somebody's an amateur or not. Yeah. Um, then, then, yeah, and they don't even get like um, a, a nice letter saying um, we are very sorry. Uh, unfortunately, you're, you're not just right there yet. I did that in the beginning, and this is when all the discussion started. Right. Uh, like everybody then, and and the worse the the so-called self-called talents are, the worse they are, the 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 harsher the the um, discussion yeah. uh, usually goes. And I then I, I, I stopped that and I said, okay, I'm not going to send out those letters. I just delete the profile, cross my fingers and pray they never come back to me again. Right. And it's a service really that you're providing to the talent because, you know, if you do let them on and they just frankly publicly embarrass themselves, that's not going to be good for their own career anyway. Well, and, and well, okay, the embarrassment is the one thing, but, but they, it, 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 it costs money yeah. them. Even if it's like only 25, 25 five euros a month that they would pay Bodalga, for example. Yeah. Um, but, but still, it's, 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 it's completely wasted yeah. because they would not stand a chance. And this is also why the audition quality of Bodalgo is much higher than with any of the other websites mm -hmm. because um, there are only vetted talents there. Uh, and you need to understand that even if you are like a professionally trained talent, you need to understand. Okay, if I if I jump in that in in that in that sea, there 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 are big sharks there. Right. And Rachel, what's your take on the pay to play market? So I think there are there are a number of reasons why you shouldn't. Why I think you shouldn't go on um, Fiverr's, um, you know, the the really low ball websites mm. to to start your career. Um, one of them is that. It's about confidence. You're starting a voiceover business. You need to respect your business. You need to respect your talent. And yeah. by kind of going, putting yourself in with the the kind of the bottom of the run, the Primark, the, you know, mm. the lowest of the low in the industry, it's very hard to then climb up. What you need yeah. to do as Armin said, is you need to get training. You need to surround yourself with people who are working, um, and you need to make sure that you're that you, that you're up to up to standard before you then go out and start working. Yeah. Um, and then my recommendation is not to go to Fiverr; is to start work, look into working in areas like telephone on hold. Mm. Um, you know, contact production companies. Build your contact list. You are a business. You really need to kind of think you're a business. You've got to put a business hat on. You need to go and find your clients and sit on Google and search, you know, local production companies and contact them. And right. you might find that there are a couple of local production companies. You could call them up or not in Germany because that's not, that's not what you do in <laughs> Germany, but, um, or email them and, um, and connect with them. Say, look, you know, you're starting out. You're a voiceover artist. You would, you, you know... Is there anything that they've got that you can do? As opposed to if you, you know, as soon as you end up putting yourself on Fiverr, there are casting directors, agents and producers who look at those websites and they won't ever use you. Right. 
So it's really tricky. And I do know it is that chicken and egg thing yeah. because, you know, you need the work, you need the experience to get the work, you mm. know, so it is tricky, but it really isn't a good idea. Many established voice talents get work through an agent. So I asked Rachel and Armin, is it even likely that you can be signed by an agent when you're first starting out? No. <laughs> I'm <a> afraid, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. But, it, it, you know, it's okay to try. But, mm. um, it, you know, I, I came into the industry 16 years ago and there were a lot less people then. Mm. And I struggled to get an agent. And even when I was when I was the voice of Virgin Media, I struggled to get an agent. It took yeah. me years and years. Um, it's not necessary. You don't have to have an agent. Agents, I think, are a very important part of the industry and I have a lot of respect for agents. Um, and I'm very lucky because I've got, you know, two fantastic agents um, here in the UK and in the US. Mm. Um, but it's not necessary. You don't have to have an agent. You're better off spending your time and energy getting clients and getting, you know, getting the experience up and getting some some regular clients so that you can then go to the agent and say, look, I am the voice of BMW. I do all their telephone on hold stuff. Yeah. You know, or I'm, you know, whatever it is so that you can then go to them and, and they, because there's so much trust that an agent has to put in a voiceover artist when they right. sign them. It's a massive amount of trust because when you go into the studio, you're you're not just representing you, you're representing the reputation of the agent so they have to yeah. massively trust you so um yeah I, I i think it's i i especially when you're starting out i wouldn't spend too much time and energy worrying about getting an agent another way to find work is to reach out to clients directly and one way of doing that is cold calling we discuss this strategy right now I think it's it's a good thing to do. I think it it depends on who you are. Mm. Um, for some people, it's absolutely terrifying. For some people, it's fine. Yeah. Um, I would say give it a go because you never know. I mean, the thing about cold calling, you want to... It's better not to cold call. So it's better to call after you've sent an email. So right. find out some details about them. Follow them on social media. So when you find, let's say, you find a production company that you want to work for, find, get their website, find them on social media, follow them on Twitter, find them on Facebook, find out some information about them, send them an email, mm. send them your details on an email. And then I would say after that, you can call them. But it's when, like a lukewarm call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's better to do it that way as opposed to... But I mean, there are a lot of production companies who... They would happily take your call and say, "Yeah, sure, I'll I'll use you," because they because they they need talent, they need voiceover artists, and it's especially the kind of smaller ones that are local to you guys. You know, the, the local production companies who are doing the um, the corporate videos and the website videos and the telephone on hold stuff and all of that. They need mm. new talent all the time, so give them a call or email them. <laughs> Yeah, so the, there is, I mean, I, I feel like there's slightly, there's more, there's a difference between cold calling someone and cold emailing because cold, a call is quite an intrusive thing, but an email you can sort of get to at any point. I feel more comfortable sending an email than giving someone a call, but I can definitely see that yeah. production companies, ad agencies and stuff, they're, they're used to that. They're used to receiving calls from, from talent, but yeah. maybe not. I mean, I don't know how you feel about this. Companies directly, like the end, you know, the, the person who's actually no, would be hiring no, I you. Wouldn't, I wouldn't call them directly. But in no. terms of, um, yeah, I mean, just picking up the phone and th they, yeah, they're, they're happy to receive your call. Just, yeah, not to worry too much about it. I think a, a call probably has, of course, much more impact than, than an email. And mm. also an email, well, it's, it's only hitting backspace once and the email is gone. Right. Um, the, the callee can't do that with a caller that easy. So and if you are great uh, on, on the phone uh, and, and you have those quality of a, of a salesman, then give it a go and, and, and try it. It was just never for me. Um, I, I always used the, the, the social media networks like like mm. uh, Crossing or, well, mainly Crossing because I never liked LinkedIn that much. But I know it's a big thing, but mm. I mm. just didn't, didn't really like it that much. 
and um, and that kind of worked. But that was not for my own voiceover career. It was like getting clients on board for Budalgo. Mm. Right. And and I mean the thing about email as well. Email's great, but it's cu- it, it's gone. And I don't know about you guys, but my inbox is a scary place. <laughs> it really is. It is a scary place. Yeah, so, you leave it um, a few hours. <laughs> yeah, it just... So the chance of somebody opening your email and reading it is not as high as it used to be. So that's why, you know, you just need to be a bit more creative. And if they don't get back to you, don't worry. Don't think, oh, gosh, they don't like me. Sometimes... I've had jobs, you know, years later from somebody I emailed, they didn't get back to me, they didn't respond at all. And yeah. then they've called me up and said, I'd like to book you for something. You sent me an email what, three or four years ago? Yeah. And 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 they book you for work. So you need to, I quite like, it's like um, planting seeds when you're when you're contacting people and doing your marketing yeah. you're just planting seeds and when you're 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 following up with them it's kind of cultivating those those relationships those seeds okay and the final question in this episode is should you work for free to get your foot in the door easy no let's finish this podcast okay. <laughs> <laughs> no there's uh, no, seriously okay. there's only one thing that I could think of now on top of my head where you would say, no, I don't charge you anything. And this is for any social, um, like, uh, what do you call those? Um, like non-profit organizations, oh, something right. like that. Like a charity. There, there you could, and if it, if it filled your boots, uh, then you, you, you can do that. You would never, ever do any, with the slightest sense of commercial work, you would never, ever, ever do that. Mm. Right. Thank you to this week's guests. Thanks also to our sponsor, J. Michael Collins, social media support from Chris Sharps and Backstage Magazine. Join us next week for another class.